Hello everyone, again I'm Joe Suresh and uh, I'm going to talk to you today about a project that I worked on and I used uh, spatial correlations to perform image analysis on, on some neuro neuronal data structures that I captured. So um, just a quick recap of the network structures that I was looking at. In this, uh, uh, in this slide I'm showing you two neurons, uh, each having a cell body and uh, with the dendrites and then the single axon from cell one terminating at a dendrite on um, cell number two. So you see the cell body, dendrites, axon terminals and the synapse that's formed between the axon terminal and the dendrite of the neighboring neuron. Uh, more specifically, I captured just these following four structures in my images, cell bodies, dendrites, the presynaptic terminal and the postsynaptic terminal. So it's not possible to capture a synapse itself. A synapse is formed when you have a presynaptic terminal and postsynaptic terminal. So these are the four structures that I captured. And I used a Aleka confocal microscope in order to capture these images. And <coughs> the, the, new, the, the networks, these are basically dissociated hippocampal um, neurons from, from a rat, and uh, these were grown on, these were basically fixed and stained on cover slips, and these two circles represent the, the two cover slips, uh, and this is the microscope slide. So when you actually put the slide um, under the microscope, you would capture images like these, and uh, so I used, we used four different wavelengths of light to capture uh, these four structures, which are the cell bodies shown as shown white in color here. And the green signal represents the dendrites. And these are, they're really tiny, you can't see here, but they're red, uh, almost spherical structures, which are the postsynaptic terminal. And then similarly, the blue signal represents the presynaptic terminals. And this is just a cartoon showing the different signal colors are representing the different structures. Um, just to give you an idea of what my project exactly was, uh, so I captured images of networks at different developmental stages, and the goal was to actually count the number of synapses at each of these developmental stages. So here you see how the network looks at when the culture is five days in vitro, the dendrites, the blue, the green signal, it's just beginning to you know, form, but they're not completely connected. And then this is how the network looks at eight days in vitro. And at 14 days in vitro, you see how complicated the network is getting. And then at 20 days in vitro. So I wanted to count the number of synapses at each of these developmental stages. Um, okay, so here I'm just showing you a close up of one of those images with all those different signals, the four signals. And you see that there is a pre and post synaptic terminal that is the red and the blue signal all over the place. I wanted to end up with an image which looked like this. What are, how many synapses are there lying just on the dendrites, meaning the, the green signal? So that was my goal. And so I just want to quickly walk you through how I captured the images. So here you see two cover slips with the networks the neuronal networks fixed and stained on these cover slips. And for each cover slip, I basically divided each cover slip into 81 square grids, and I captured images from each of those square grids. So here, I'm showing you one, of one such image captured from a grid. The dimensions of this image is 50 micrometers by 50 micrometers. So what you're seeing here is actually a merged image of these four different channels, but when I actually capture the data, I capture it as four different channels. Um, the blue channel is again the post uh, capturing just the postsynaptic terminal or puncta. I use the term interchangeably here. And then the red channel captures the presynaptic puncta. The green is the dendrites, and then the black and white is the nuclear the cell bodies. So I'm going to use this small uh, red rectangular region 
I'm going to zoom into that region to explain how I performed image analysis. So again, I specifically wanted to quantify the count of synapses in terms of synaptic density. So I wanted to count the number of co-localized pre- and post-synaptic puncta, which form the synapse. And then I normalized it by the total dendritic area and the total number of cells within the image. So one of the challenges we ran into are you see the red and blue signal that lies outside the dendrite. We couldn't quite make uh, you know we couldn't quite make sense out of it. What do you mean by synapses lying out of the dendrites, outside the dendrites? So it could be that the network was still developing and I couldn't catch the dendrites properly. So maybe these are real synapses on the dendrites. Or another reason could be non-target structures were getting stained. So we, these probably don't represent the real pre- and post-synaptic terminals. But so I decided to ignore those. Uh, I, I've labeled them as non-specific staining here. And what I was interested is in counting how many synapses lie on this green signal, which represents the dendrites. So further zooming into it, I wanted to count these structures, the red and green, the red and blue signals lying on the green signal. All right. So I sh uh, initially told you I had 81 images per cover slip, and I had many cover slips. So I, I couldn't. I had to come up with an automated script that basically takes in a whole array of images and spits out the count per image. So this is the algorithm for that image analysis procedure. First, input the original. It's a 12-bit image. Extract the signal from the image. Second step, so here I'm showing a cartoon where I extract the signals. So the, the blue signal is, again, post-synaptic puncta. The red is the pre-synaptic puncta. And the green is the dendrites. Second step is I wanted to co-localize and quantify only those co uh, uh, puncta on the dendrites because of the non-specific staining issue. So then all these structures lying outside the dendrites fall out. So, so I was interested in capturing just these structures. And lastly, uh, it's quite possible that some of these co-localizations just happen by random chance. And so I wanted to estimate how many of these occur by random ch chance. And this is where I made use of spatial correlation. So we'll quickly try and get to that step. So here, all I'm trying to explain is at step two, I get a total count for synaptic density as five. But then after I estimate the number of false co-localizations, which in this case is two, five minus two, three would be an estimate of the potentially true synapses lying on the dendrites. Um, so the exact details of how I extracted the signal is beyond the scope of this talk. But uh, for you guys, the important take home in this slide is this is the original 12-bit 12 12-bit 12 raw image of the puncta channels. And then I end up, through a series of filtering procedures and thresholding procedures, I end up with a binary mask where you have white, these white circular masks represent the, the puncta signal, the terminals, and on a black background. So basically, for the puncta signal, you end up with a binary mask where the white pixels are the puncta. And for the dendrites, again, you see, I, I start with the 12-bit raw image, and I end up with a binary mask. The white signal, the white pixels represent the signal. So step one is accomplished. I have extracted my signal. Step two, so, so this is the output of the extracted signal, right? Step two, I only want to co-localize those pre- and post-synaptic terminals lying on top of the dendrite. And that was quite easy. All I had to do is I have three binary masks. I, had, I performed a binary and of these three masks to give me an idea of the synapses lying on the dendrites. So here I'm just showing you superimposed on the dendrites, the, the synapses that I identified from this step. But remember, we had one more task, and that was to estimate how many of these co-localizations are by chance. 
And so in order to do that, um, I made use of the, the high spatial correlation that exists between the pre and postsynaptic ter terminals on the dendrites, right? So if, th if there is a real, potentially true, uh, real synapse, there's a high correlation between each of those puncta pairs. So if you destroy that spatial correlation and then perform that binary AND procedure, you'll get an estimate of how many of those co-localizations happen by chance. So let me explain that in detail. So um, these are the original masks that I extract from step number one. And then the way I destroy the spatial correlation is from in each of the masks, simply randomize the location of the, the puncta, <coughs> puncta location. So here you see a systematic structure. All I did was I just randomly replaced the locations of those masks. So that's one way you can destroy the spatial correlation. And the other way, the other strategy is I, I spatially shifted the original mask. So this, this mask, I moved it down. I shifted it to the right bottom. And then the presynaptic mask, I shifted it to the top left, OK? And now, so, so in this case, I had these original masks, and I performed a binary AND. Let's say I got a count for the synaptic density as 25. When I destroyed the spatial correlation by randomizing the puncta location, and then I perform the binary AND of the three masks, I get a synaptic density count of 7. Okay, So that is the estimate of my noise. What you see in the original step is signal plus noise, an estimate of signal plus noise. And this is an estimate of the noise. Okay, So this was from method 1. So from method 2, uh, remember I said I just had to uh, spatially shift the mask. So in this case, I shifted this mask to the left bottom. This is this to right top. And then I perform a binary AND. I get a s around a s similar estimate, about 6. So there's two different ways you can do these things to estimate how many co-localizations happen by chance. I'm trying to uh, establish here that both methods gave me roughly the same results. Okay. Um, so a recap of the steps. I captured my original images. These are the different 12-bit channels. And then I extracted the signal in the form of binary masks. Performing a binary AND of the three masks gives me an estimate of synaptic density, which is signal plus noise. And then I estimate the number of co-localizations by simply moving, destroying the correlation, spatial correlation. And then when I perform a binary AND of the three masks and count the number of synapses, that gives me an estimate of the noise. Um, so I'm just trying to show you the results in terms of numbers. So this is a carton of that microscope slide that I showed you, and then the two cover slips. The first cover slip had 81 images. Not all 81 images are good quality, so I basically ended up with 51 good images from this cover slip. This green signal is showing the synaptic density that I calculated from step one which is basically signal plus noise. The red signal represents my noise estimate, which I got after moving the masks around. And so you can see that almost all images on this cover slip have pretty much the same noise level. And so the difference between these two values will give you the estimate of the potentially real synapses. So when I repeat the same procedure with the other method, what I'm showing you here is I take one particular image, uh, which is image number four. The top, uh, uh, the top of this uh, trend line shows, shows the count of synaptic density when I didn't shift the, the images. Okay, These were the original mask images. And then I slowly start moving them away from each other. So what you see in the bottom is the number of pixel shift. So as I keep shifting the pixels and the images are going farther and farther away, you see that it hits a baseline noise level, right? And when I compare my results from both methods, 
again this was uh, this particular graph on the left is showing here the, the blue dot is showing that fourth image that I was talking about and this value I didn't print it here but it's 51.83 and then the noise estimate I got from randomizing the masks was 25.448 and then when I repeated the same uh, noise estimation using method 2 where I shift the pixels I get almost similar results for the noise level. So both these methods uh, produce similar results and that's how I estimated my synaptic counts. So here I'm just showing that the difference between the two values gives you an estimate of potentially true synapses. And this was this is this slide is the final one where I'm showing the results of this study. Um, I wanted to understand how does the uh, synaptic density vary? Does it vary like does it increase with age? Does it increase and fall? Or you know what is the trend and I calculated the synaptic density separately for excited resynapses shown in blue here and this is the uh, this is my tracing of the synaptic density uh, the development of synaptic density for the inhibitory synapses and so these are the trend lines that show up during development so yeah that's all I had Okay, so I'm gonna talk about um, some of the work that I did in Wim's lab this summer. Um, so I'm using these techniques we just learned about cross-correlation and coherence to um, examine some data from human epilepsy patients. Um, so these are where the data come from. Um, so basically, it's a very spe uh, specific subset of patients. Um, those who have focal epilepsy, where the seizures are emanating from a uh, particular part of the brain. Um, Basically, the first line of treatment is to try anti-epileptic drugs, and if several of those don't work, then their kind of last resort is surgery where they actually remove the, um, the epileptic uh, tissue. Um, so before they do that, they do a, um, a surgical evaluation where they place a grid of electrodes subdurally to try to figure out where exactly the seizures are coming from. And some of WIMS collaborators in Columbia um, are actually uh, have the okay to additionally place this multi-electrode array along with that grid of electrodes. Um, so I'm showing the array here and you can see that it's very small. So it's, this is about the size of a typical electrode that would be on that grid. And this array contains 96 microelectrodes. So they actually penetrate into the cortex and you can see the histology there. Um, you get recordings from layers four and five. Um, so you're looking at a very small network. Um, so just to briefly review the um, the two techniques that I used and how I used them. Um, so this is cross-correlation. So I'm just showing an extremely simple example with these two signals that I created, um, signal X in the blue and Y in the cyan. So they both have sinusoidal components um, and I shifted Y a little bit earlier um, by pi over four. Um, so in this example, we should be able to find that Y is kind of leading um, X. Um, so if we perform cross-correlation on the two signals, um, we get this um, sinusoidal, oops, this sinusoidal result where the x-axis is the time lag of the two signals relative to each other. Um, so how much we've shifted signal x versus signal y, and we can see the peak of the cross correlation occurs here at a positive time lag. So you need to um, essentially shift y forward in time so that it maximally correlates with x. Um, so from there we can infer that um, signal y is leading signal x. Um, okay, so we can do a similar um, type of analysis with coherence, this time in the frequency domain. So it's frequency band specific. So basically, um, here I'm kind of showing you how it works. Um, so I've decomposed these two, where I've, I've performed Fourier analysis to get the power spectra of these two signals. So you can see very clearly how I obtained both of them. And you can see they both have this peak at five hertz. Um, if you perform coherence, so you take the cross spectra and normalize by the auto spectra of each signal, um, you see that coherence is pretty much one at five hertz because even though they're shifted relative to each other, they both share this frequency band. Um, so then if we were to look at this, um, we might say, oh, this frequency band is pretty interesting because there's such a high coherence. So that allows us to go on and look at the phase coherence. Um, so we take the kind of the phase of the two signals relative to each other. 
In this case, you can see that at 5 hertz, the phase coherence is about negative 45 degrees, which is exactly uh, how I created the signals. They're shifted by about 45 degrees. Um, so in this case, we can again infer that the signal Y is leading signal X because of the sign of this phase coherence is negative. All right. So here's, the, here's a, an example with some of the data, and then I'm going to show you an example from a full array. Um, so this little square grid on the bottom is the MIA. So these are the, the multi-electrode array. So these are the actual channels, um, 1 through 96. And in red, I'm showing you these six channels that I just pulled out um, to show you. So you can see there's a 30, this is a 30-second um, time slice <coughs> where um, basically what you're looking at is right before the seizure starts, you get these um, characteristic, they're called heralding spikes. Um, and then the activity looks relatively normal for a while. And then the seizure starts to develop, especially in channels three and four. And then you can see the seizure, this very high amplitude activity spreads until it reaches pretty much all the channels. Um, at this point, it's the full-blown seizure. Um, so again, if I, t if I do Fourier analysis of this seizure, um, it turns out this peak is right around 6 or 7 hertz, so right in the theta frequency band. Um, and this is going to be important for coherence analysis later. All right, so if I do cross-correlation um, of each pair of channels, I can basically um, build a, a graph or a network. Um, so here it is. So I'm just plotting them in a little hexagon, totally arbitrarily. And each arrow basically represents the output of cross-correlation analysis. So again, the direction of the arrow is, um, is indicating um, whether the time lag is negative or positive. Um, and then the width of the arrow is the strength of the cross-correlation, the maximal strength of the cross-correlation, so kind of the strength of the, the functional connectivity between these two channels. Um, and then from the time lag, we can also get kind of a speed. Um, and you'll note that these are in milliseconds. So these time lags are essentially um, some of them are, are probably direct, represent direct synaptic connections. Um, so it's a very small network that we're looking at. Um, so if we do coherence analysis, we get um, something a little bit different depending on what frequency band you're looking at. So you can see in the theta frequency band that I've plotted on, the, um, on your left here, um, the network looks extremely similar to the cross-correlation network, and that's because the seizure activity is the highest amplitude thing that you see in the entire signal. Um, so you can see that channels four and three, where the seizure kind of starts, tend to have a lot of outputs, right, which is what we expect to find. Whereas, like for example, channels one and two tend to have mostly inputs, and the seizure does indeed seem to start later in those channels. So we see the exact same thing if we look at just the theta band, which is a coherence um, network. Um, but if we look at, for example, this is kind of a delta band or a very high gamma, um, we get very different looking networks, which could be interesting depending on what you're looking for. Um, all right, so then I went ahead and applied the same analyses to the full set of channels. Um, and so I've grayed out some of the channels from which we didn't get great signal. Um, so we're mainly looking at these blue, or we're looking at these blue channels here in the MIA. Um, the other thing I did was split up the data into epochs to start to look at changes over time and kind of changes in the network as the seizure starts and it develops. Um, so basically, if you do the same cross-correlation and coherence analyses and build a network for each epoch, um, you get <laughs> graphs that look like this. Um, so you can see here, um, I basically thresholded it just kind of arbitrarily. So the only arrows being plotted are the strongest um, connections. Um, and you can see as the seizure develops, not only do you get more arrows, the arrows are also a little bit thicker, um, but you also get um, more global connections. So in general, if you look at this grid, consecutive numbers tend to be next to each other um, on the grid spatially, um, so that when you plot this circle, you can't really see the numbers, but these are consecutive numbers. So the, con the arrows going around the outside of the circle are, in general, local connections. Um, but by the end of the seizure, you kind of have these just global, the whole patch of cortex is kind of acting together. Um, so why, why on earth would we want to um, 
take this LFP data and make it into a giant circle. Um, so one nice thing about this format is it then allows the use of a lot of powerful tools from graph theory to go ahead and quantify um, what's going on in this network during a seizure. Um, and it also allows you to compare um, networks. So either um, the same patient across time or the same patient, um, maybe two different seizures or two different brain states, just sleeping, not sleeping. Um, or potentially we could compare two different patients. Um, so these are just a few like extremely simple um, kind of graph theory measures. Um, so degree and causal density both kind of quantify how many connections um, each node or channel has, whereas causal flow looks at um, the number of inputs relative to the number of outputs. Um, so if I then plot um, each channel, um, all these measures for each channel, so here I'm showing over the four epochs in time, um, each of these big squares is the MIA in space, and the color is showing the graph theory measure. So in this case, causal density. Um, you can see that over time, um, at first, there, most, of the, most of the channels have very few connections, the low causal density. And then over time, um, it builds up that many of them have many connections. Um, and then in causal flow, you can see that, so a positive causal flow indicates more outputs than inputs. Um, so you can see that um, one side of the, the MIA has mostly a positive causal flow in, in white, so it tends to have, this, this side is having, um, it's sending out more outputs, whereas the dark side is um, kind of receiving inputs during the course of the seizure. Um, and another nice thing just to kind of point out is that we can boil this whole network down to like a single number if we wanted to. So the example I'm showing here is mean degree. So you could just um, report the mean degree of a single network if you wanted to compare to a different network. Um, and that's all I have. Thanks. So that means that uh, the remainder of the time we are going to talk about uh, Laplace and Z transform. And in the book, you can, most of that you can find in chapter 9. These transforms are really useful to solve differential and difference equations to uh, kind of analyze dynamical systems. And uh, I'll show you uh, one figure in the, in the book. That is uh, figure 9.1. That's the first figure in that chapter here. And that basically shows you on the bottom that if you have some kind of an, uh, uh, an, an uh, dynamic equation, differential or difference equation, you can, of course, directly try to solve that, and that usually works. But one other way of doing that is to transform the equation into uh, the Laplace or Z domain, solve it there, and then take the solution and solve it back into the time domain. And believe it or not, sometimes that's easier. Because once you are in the Laplace or Z domain, a lot of stuff uh, is fairly easy to, uh, uh, um, to deal with because uh, uh, differential and difference equations now become simple algebraic equations. So let's first uh, talk about what is the Laplace transform. And let's uh, compare that to the Fourier transform you already know. So the Fourier transform of some time domain, uh, and that could be spatial again, of course, is this, isn't it? So the Laplace transform is actually pretty similar. And uh, 
as you can see, there are two differences here. One difference is the uh, lower uh, integration limit. Instead of minus infinity, uh, we take it uh, zero. Uh, there is a version of the Laplace transform that starts at minus infinity. That's called the two-sided Laplace transform. But usually, for simplicity, we assume that everything beyond uh, zero, smaller than zero, is zero anyway. So then it would not contribute to that uh, integral. And for that reason, we can uh, keep this at uh, zero. I have to say that, in general, we look a little bit at the negative side of zero. So we're looking all the way at the beginning. And uh, the other thing is that uh, here I have j omega, which is a uh, imaginary uh, number. And here we use s. And s is actually a complex number. So S has a real and an imaginary component, whereas the Fourier transform only has the imaginary component. Now you also have the inverse uh, transform for uh, the Laplace. It's actually a lot more complicated than the inverse transform for the Fourier transform. And as a matter of fact, uh, usually um, you will uh, you will apply this by uh, using the tables instead of using these, uh, uh, using these equations. So in some cases, it's easy to use them. But once you get more complex equations, uh, uh, there is uh, a wealth of uh, tables. And uh, tables for Fourier and uh, uh, Laplace transforms who already did this integration for you. And a very simple one is on page 163. But that's a very simple one. If you go online, uh, if you Google uh, Laplace or Fourier transforms, you can find uh, plenty of uh, sites that show you uh, uh, tables. In the past, you had to go to the library to get these thick books. But now that's really easy. So why is this uh, Laplace transform so uh, practical? Well, part of it has to do with uh, the way uh, the derivative of a function uh, pans out. If you take the Laplace transform, which I will now indicate by this uh, capital L and this uh, square bracket, if I take the time derivative of a function and I take the Laplace transform of that, then basically by just applying the uh, equation I would get this. And we're going to deal with this uh, uh, integral. In this case, we will not go to a table. We will really look at, uh, uh, at the solution. Uh, it's not so difficult. We can do the uh, integration in parts here. Did you want to ask something? Oh, thank you. Now let's keep it one-sided. So <coughs> if, we, uh, if we do this, uh, we, uh, we can use integration in parts. And you will see in a bit why it's actually practical to do it one-sided, because it just works out uh, a little bit uh, better. Um, if we say integration in parts, just so uh, you, uh, you may uh, you may get. Uh, you have this equation, isn't it? If you have some integral, you can solve that integral by, uh, by doing it, uh, by following this. So let's say that uh, in this case, we, uh, we set u at minus uh, e minus st, which means that u prime, which is the derivative, is this. Huh? And of course, dv in this case would be 
the derivative of uh, f t d t, which means that v would be simply f t. And so if we now plug in these values in this uh, equation, we uh, get uh, We get this, isn't it? So I just did, uh, I looked at the Laplace transform of a derivative. I applied the definition. I used integration in parts. I defined my u and v functions uh, as follows. I plugged it in, and this is my result. So that first term, and now you see why it's easy to have the, <laughs> the one-sided, because this thing is going to be uh, at infinity is going to be 0. And so that means that uh, this is going to be minus f0, uh, isn't it? Because at 0, this thing uh, is 1. And at infinity, this thing is 0, so this exponential. And then I can take the uh, s out of the whole thing. And now I get this. And <coughs> as you can see, that's nothing else than the Laplace transform of, uh, of f eh, times s. So that means that the Laplace transform of the derivative of a function is simply s times its Laplace transform. And if you are smart <laughs> and you set your initial condition to 0, you can just... Uh, Ignore this thing. Of course, if it's not zero, you cannot ignore it. So be always careful that, uh, that you look at the initial condition. But suppose you do an experiment, do it such that your initial condition is zero, because then if you want to work with it, it's a lot easier. And for the same thing, uh, if you had a Laplace transform of your second derivative, That would give you <coughs> s squared fs, again, under the condition that uh, your initial conditions are 0. So you see that the derivation in the Laplace domain is really simple. You just multiply with s. Let's do an example. Um, the last uh, lecture, we looked at this uh, uh, figure A2, where we had this uh, uh, case of a uh, simplified membrane uh, model. Uh, so we, uh, we have some kind of an, uh, 
let's say, is the simplified membrane model where you have the ion uh, uh, battery, with the NAMS potential. You have your membrane resistance and you have your membrane capacitance. Mm -hmm. um, you can actually check that uh, again in the book, but uh, this leads to the following equation. Now let's uh, pretend that we uh, think that this uh, unit is actually an, uh, an LTI system, a black box system. And we really want to know what is uh, its unit impulse response, or H. Because again, if you know H from an LTI system, we know what the system is. Well, we can easily do that by giving an, uh, an input uh, delta uh, to this uh, system, and then automatically uh, H will come out, and then we'll know what it is. I think you have a pretty good guess what the Laplace transform of the delta function is. You know already what the, the Fourier transform of the delta function is, isn't it? One, yeah. Because the, as I said, for the Laplace transform, we look at the minus side of zero. So that means that the delta function is totally encapsulated in the integral. So you can use the sifting property, which means then you have the exponential zero, which is one. Well, that means that uh, the Laplace transform of this thing is uh, going to be 1. Now, let's say that the Laplace transform of our output here, we're going to say that it is uh, ys. And this thing, we're going we're gonna to be smart uh, experimenters. We're going to set the initial condition to 0. Uh, so that means that uh, I can now do this. And now the Laplace transform of the input x, which is the delta function, is 1. See, now I basically let Laplace transformed my differential equation. And instead of having to solve the differential equation, I can use simple algebra to uh, determine what ys is. And in this case, Ys is also Hs because uh, we gave it the uh, unit impulse. Huh? Now, that's the part, if you want to use tables, where you have to get a little handy in, uh, uh, in your algebraic uh, uh, formulation, because this expression you won't find in a table. Uh, but if you rewrite it as uh, as such, you can find this expression in a table. And this is a constant, so constant you don't really care about eh, in the inverse transform. That basically remains there. And if you apply that, uh, if you find, uh, if you use this in the table, uh, you will find that uh, your result is uh, not really unexpected. You can actually find this one in the table uh, that we have in the that we have in the book. So now you basically solved the uh, unit impulse response of the membrane model. 
So, and since we now know this, we, we know this model. We have no questions anymore. So since I know this one, I can uh, we, uh, uh, you found that out why convolution in the time domain was multiplication in the Fourier domain. That's what we did last time, isn't it? As a matter of fact, you can uh, really you run the same proof for the Laplace domain. So that means that if you know what HS is, you can just multiply that with the uh, Laplace transform of its input, inverse transform it, and you will know what that is, what the system is doing. This thing, and I have rewritten it here, but this, this expression in the S domain, <coughs> let's say the Laplace transform of the unit impulse response, is uh, also called the transfer function. And here I should have uh, pointed out that I write yt, but I could have just said it's ht because uh, uh, in this particular case uh, we had uh, given it uh, the unit impulse as input, so the output by definition is the unit impulse response. So transfer function, unit impulse response are basically a Laplace transform pair. So you see how handy it is to uh, work in the Laplace domain. How quickly, uh, and of course this is a pretty simple uh, uh, differential equation you could have done this thing directly, and you would have gotten this uh, out of there as well, fairly directly. But if your uh, differential equations get a, more, a little more complicated, plus transform can be pretty handy to, uh, to uh, use. So that's uh, using the Laplace transform for continuous time and for differential equations. Yeah, you probably will not be surprised uh, to learn that uh, you can also extend this to uh, discrete time. And difference equations. And in order to do that, let's have a look what the uh, Laplace transform is of a delay. So here we have a Laplace transform again. Here we have our function uh, f again. But now we give our function a little delay tau. And I can write that down. As you noticed, it's, it's not very critical, but I put my under limit at tau here because, of course, if I shift my function, which is zero for all negative values, if I shift it for the amount of tau, everything lower than tau will be zero. So for that reason, I, uh, I can replace the zero by tau, but I could leave the zero in place. doesn't really matter. Well, and we go back to our... Uh, Typical thing, we take uh, capital T, this T minus tau, and uh, we're going to rewrite this uh, <coughs> 
and then we get this expression. And that, of course, can be rewritten. I can split the exponentials and get the tau out of there. So that means that if I, um, if I do a delay, if I give this thing a delay, it, uh, it means that I just uh, remain, uh, the, the I, I just keep the, the, the usual uh, Laplace transform. I just have to multiply it uh, with uh, e minus uh, e to the exponent at minus s tau. And this thing is often written as z minus 1, hence the z transform. So the z transform is nothing else than the Laplace transform. But it is applied for, um, it is applied for discrete time, just as you had for the Fourier transform. Eh, if you had uh, the fast Fourier transform, for instance, was also for discrete time. You had this twiddle factor, isn't this? This w. Uh, you just instead of writing these exponentials, you just give it some some more handy uh, uh, symbol. So if you now have, uh, let's say, a uh, discrete function x n, which for instance is uh, Suppose I have some kind of a discrete function uh, consisting of a number of terms. Uh, this is the, the first value, this is the second value, this is the third value, etc. And now suppose that I want to take the Laplace transform of this. Well, I can just apply the Laplace transform of any Every, every term here, isn't it? So what happens with this term? Laplace transform of this thing, what's that? Right? Laplace transform of the delta function is 1, so, yeah? So what's the Laplace transform of this one? Yeah. So this is uh, e to the minus s tau, or if you prefer, z minus 1. Yep. This one. Yep, minus 2, et cetera. See, so it's pretty simple to... Uh, go from uh, the discrete time domain to the Laplace domain to the z domain. Also here the inverse transform is, uh, is not very handy. I mean this is easy, inverse transform isn't. So um, uh, it's a lot of work and uh, you can see what the inverse transform equation is on page 162 if you are interested in uh, looking at it. But uh, I would uh, strongly suggest, uh, just as for the Laplace and Fourier transform, that uh, unless you have uh, a real uh, good reason uh, to
to just use tables. And there is a simple table at uh, 164, but again, if you need more, if you need more extensive, just Google it and uh, you get lots and lots of uh, data. Look at the simple example. <coughs> Let's uh, look at a discrete differentiator. I'm sorry for the sound. <laughs> But I have to do this. <laughs> so a discrete differentiator would be an output yn is uh, xn minus xn minus 1 divided by delta. Huh? And delta is the time step. Now if we, uh, if we translate this into the z domain, we get... Uh, we call this thing yz. This thing we call xz. Since this is uh, minus 1, it's z minus 1 xz. And then we divide this by delta. So this is the discrete time domain. And this is the z domain. Now again, we want to know what the uh, transfer function is because uh, then we know the system. So let's say this differentiator has uh, unit impulse response uh, hn. If we now feed it uh, the unit impulse, we will automatically get uh, hn out of this. Of course, this thing again in the z domain is 1. Kind of uh, know that the Laplace transform is still one, and this thing we're gonna call H Z. Now let's plug that in our equation. That means that uh, our X Z is gonna be one, isn't it? Because that's gonna be the Z transform of the unit impulse, so that's gonna be one. And then if we do that, then yz is by definition going to be the transfer function. So if we plug that in, so here xz is 1. Because we are using delta n. And then... For that reason, this thing becomes hz, and this is 1 minus z minus 1 divided by delta. Then usually, if you have discrete time, instead of uh, working with this delta, which is your, uh, your, your time step, uh, you define your time step as 1. And so now we get uh, this for our transfer function. And you can uh, usually also you have to uh, use a little bit of algebra to uh, 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 rewrite this a little bit. But in this case, it's, it's actually not difficult to see what this is going to be, uh, what this is going to be in, the, uh, um, in the discrete time domain. Because if I if we just recall what this was, then this was just the Laplace transform of delta n. And this was the Laplace transform of delta n shifted by one unit, isn't it?
So in other words, if um, if I give this unit an uh, unit impulse at the input, at the output, I will get a unit impulse followed by one step later an inverse unit impulse and that's my HN. You probably need a little bit of time to digest all this, but uh, uh, but you'll get handy with this, and we will use it again and again and again. So don't worry, you will get used to this. Uh, um, you have to get used to this because this is uh, how you analyze linear systems, and when you start to analyze nonlinear systems, this is basically a variant on what we are doing here. So once you have understood this, uh, um, you uh, uh, you really uh, yeah, you're really getting very powerful analyzing systems. Let's summarize this. So if we have a linear time invariant system, an LTI system, uh, it's very useful to know HD, or in discrete time HN, which we indicate as the unit impulse response, isn't it? And once we know what HD or HN or the unit impulse response is, I can easily look at uh, the output by doing a convolution. So this is in the time domain. Huh? Now we just saw that uh, in the uh, Laplace domain, which is also often uh, indicated as the symbolic domain, uh, we have the equivalent of this, uh, Hs for continuous time, or uh, Hz for discrete time, and we call that the transfer function. And now if we want to know what the output is, we can uh, simply take uh, in the symbolic domain the product of the Laplace transform of H and uh, the Laplace transform of the input, and then transform it back using a table. And last but not least, we had seen previously in the frequency domain we have uh, the Fourier transform of uh, H, or actually also uh, you can have also the discrete time. And this thing is called the frequency response. And also in the frequency domain, we can use a simple multiplication and transform back 
in order to do uh, uh, to perform a convolution or an equivalent to convolution in the time domain. Now, I'm going to warn you that some people are a little sloppy with this term. So you will find people that will call this thing the frequency response. Shouldn't do it, but it happens a lot. And they basically should say it's a transfer function. But and it doesn't happen that often, but sometimes this thing is also called a transfer function. So people are sometimes a bit sloppy with the terminology. But this is the the correct way. This is the way you should do it. It's not a big deal, of course. It's uh, just a word. So this is actually not a bad table to kind of keep in mind and to get back to in the future again and again. What we will do in the next lectures is that we're going to talk about filters. And a filter happens to be an LTI system. So we will use this uh, quite often uh, to analyze filters. But in a way, you could say the difference between a filter and a linear model uh, isn't big. I mean, uh, that membrane model that, I just, uh, uh, that we just looked at, you could say, well, it's a membrane model. I could also say, well, it's a filter. Uh, so uh, in both cases, it's an LTI system that you want to uh, analyze. Any questions before I give you the homework? Okay.